So I've got a really simple proposition, and that's that crowdsourcing and cultural heritage um, benefits us all. And I'd really like to have each of you think about how you might use it in your institutions. Um, so just to really quickly show you a crowdsourcing interface, this is our Playbills project. Um, computers really struggle to read the text. It's OCR doesn't quite do the job. And also they struggle to understand what's a title and what's other text. Um, they're just, the playbills are sort of too creative and inventive to really show you that. So we have people transcribe the playbills and hopefully you can see that they're really interesting. Um, when you start to look at a lot of them, you get a sense of how they changed over time. In the late 18th century, they were really plain, lots of white space. As we move further through the 19th century, they got really creative. Um, so those kinds of things give people a really good sense of things like change over time, of context. Um, we know that fake news is a menace. Um, we know that it's not a new menace, but we know that there's something about things appearing on a screen that we need to have develop more critical facilities in thinking about. So we need more critical thinkers, and I'd probably say more cynical thinkers, people who say, oh, I read this on Twitter, so it must be true. We need more people who say, that doesn't sound quite right. Maybe I'll just research it before I retweet it, or maybe I'll just you know, check it out before I like it on Facebook and spread that news. Um, so there's a lot of work into how things like crowdsourcing um, can aid historical thinking. So getting people to think more about what they're seeing on a screen, thinking more about is it really the end times now, or have we always been going through end times? Um, Francis Bacon is one of my favorite sources for that because he was really concerned about information overload, and that was about four or five hundred years ago. So nothing's new under the sun. Um, budgets will never match the needs that we have. This is the newspaper storage um, facility in our northern site. Um, crowdsourcing is one way that we can help make the findable, the unfindable findable. Um, and a lot of the conversations that we've had over the past two days have been about engaging people with collections, letting them know that they're there, making it easier for people to use the collections, and crowdsourcing can help with that. Um, and if you are on Twitter, you can have a look at the at libcrowds account and see some of the conversations or some of the conversations on the Playbills forum where people are talking about the historical context. Um, each time they have a conversation, they're spreading the news slightly. They're creating a different relationship with the British Library. They feel a more intimate connection with the library. Many of them have never been into the library, never will come into the library, but they're really, um, they have a good relationship with us. Um, of course, this does rely on having digitized the collections in the first place, as so much of the digital scholarship we've been talking about does. Um, budgets will always be at risk. Um, and in the UK, we've really seen um, discussion about local libraries. When a local library chain uh, looks at closing, um, people go to its defence. They say, we can't close it. I go there every day to um, have my kids' story time. I borrow books because I'm building a pergola in the garden. Um, libraries, local libraries have a place in people's lives. And I think crowdsourcing is one way that other institutions can have a place in people's lives. Otherwise, you might only visit the British Library once on a school excursion or go to your local history museum when your aunt visits from overseas. Um, so there's lots of reasons why you might think about crowdsourcing. I think it's not a technical issue. It's about people. It's about connecting people with collections. So I think you should all give it a go and put your collections in the spotlight. Thank you. Have you heard about Zooniverse? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Zooniverse has a very different model, and it's, I think it's actually um, fantastic that there are so many platforms that you can use for crowdsourcing now that have different affordances that produce different kinds of data. Um, the Zooniverse Project Builder, I've used that in teaching. People can get a project up and running really quickly. And they can use that to prototype, and I think that's actually one of the most amazing things about working in crowdsourcing now is there are so many entry-level tools that you can just try it, see what happens. It reduces the cost of experimentation massively. So thanks for raising that. Adam. Um, so a lot of us use IIIF to provide access to our collections. <laughs> Uh, if you use, <laughs> thank you, Adam. If you use AAAF, you can use this very same platform to crowdsource <laughs> your projects. <laughs> he was a plan to me. <laughs> yeah. So, what, in Australia, we call that a Dorothy Dixer, that question. But yes, if you use AAAF, 
um, then this platform is built around AAAF. It also saves masses of money because we don't need to store the digital images. We just draw them from the library's website. And then we drive people back to the library's website. Thank you.